How do you know when to bust through a wall that's standing in your life path? How do you know when to turn away from an open door? Whether you're looking to get the most out of life or just simply trying to do the right thing, it's not always easy to know what call to make. In this video, we're gonna hear from Jonathan, how to know when to walk through walls. If this is one of the first One Church TO videos you've checked out, we've actually got a free gift for you. You can find it in the Next Steps link just outside this video window. Now, just before we hear from Jonathan, we're gonna hear a song from our music team that helps set up today's talk. Stranger Things, the third most streamed Netflix series of all time, and now planning their fourth season. I guess the bigger question is, what is it about humans that from the earliest known time 
we've had this fascination with the paranormal, the metaphysical, and the religious mystical. And the biggest question, is there actually a real invisible world where we can interact with the supernatural? In this series, Jesus answers yes and shows us how to do it in a way that's not so strange after all. Hey, welcome to week three of Stranger Things, Walking Through Walls. I don't know if you've tried that recently. I do not recommend you try it because physical beings have limitations, don't we? In fact, the human body is fascinating. The human body is made up of seven times 10 to the 27th atoms. That's seven octillion atoms that make up your body. Now, of those atoms, 99% of them are oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon atoms. That's what makes up 99% of the average human being's body. There's also 41 chemical elements. That's another story. What's interesting about an atom, though, this minute part of all that is, everything that's around you right now is that 99.9999999% of atoms is actually empty space. So look around wherever you are today. I I, I look at this table, this book, everything around me. All of that, most of it is all empty space. Now the reason though we can't walk through a wall is because of something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And the Pauli exclusion principle says this, that two electrons, an electron is just a smaller part of an atom, can't be in the same space. So We can't walk through walls. We have physical limitations on us. But most humans understand that although we see this world around us, we understand that this world is more than just physical. In week one of our series, Stranger Things, our teaching pastor, Pastor Keith, helped us to understand by using the words of Jesus that he explored two worlds that actually exist. And uh, one is like the upside down. (laughs) There there is the cosmos, which is the world, the physical world around us. And the cosmos has a a set of natural laws that govern it. There's, There's gravity. There's all of these things that govern the cosmos. It's everything that we can see and touch. That's the cosmos, the world that we live in. But Jesus also talked about the eparania. And these are two Greek words But this eparania described the heavenlies, and it was a spiritual world that to Jesus, and as he was teaching, was as real as the cosmos around uh, around him. So in this series, and this is what would happen, is the miraculous in this world, and when Jesus performed miraculous miracles as he walked this planet, it was when the eparania would invade the cosmos and bend the natural laws there to perform something that was other earthish, supernatural, not common. We call them miracles. That's what happened. So in this series, Stranger Things, we're exploring the space between the eparania and the cosmos, the physical and the spiritual, and how they intersect together. So I want to take a moment, and we're going to explore these moments today about what it means to, to understand God's will and his plan for our life and making decisions in this life. You know, because we all face moments where we face walls. You ever do that in life professionally or relationally or socially? You come up against a a wall or a locked door or a closed door. Do you break down the door? Or is that door meant to be left closed? How do you know the difference? When do you know to push through in a moment? And when do you know to take a detour? See, None of us actually likes that space when we're at the precipice or the threshold of a door and we have to make a decision. Many of us stay in states of indecision, actually, because we're afraid. We, we, at that threshold, we're looking for signs, right? We want to know where to go, what to do, who to be with. And it, because they're big decisions in life. And it's often frustrating because we don't want to make a wrong decision. We want to make the best possible decision for our life because we all understand that our decisions shape our future, right? And if you're a person of faith, there's an aspect of us always wanting to follow whatever God's will is. So 
we're going to explore how you understand what God's will is as the cosmos, the natural world, and the, the eporania collide. So how do you make decisions? Now, wherever you're viewing from right now, maybe uh, post it or look around the room where you're at if you're viewing with others and just raise your hand. Are you the type of person that makes your decisions in life more based on facts? I mean, you just go through a list of the facts and you make a decision based on that. Or are you someone that kind of, you, you more often than not make decisions in life with your gut? I mean, if it feels right, if it feels good, if it doesn't, you, you don't go there. The fact is, most of us make hundreds of decisions every day, and most of them are based on facts. We, we don't touch hot stoves because factually we've learned that uncomfortable things happen when we do that. <laughs> we wear certain things, we eat certain things, we listen to certain things because they bring some sort of comfort or joy to us. We, facts, I'm just speaking facts. Most of us make decisions on facts. We usually lean into our gut when the facts are a little unclear. When we come up against bigger questions in life, like who should you marry in this life? Or what should you do in this life? Or what major should you, do, should you take? Should you leave your present job and, and take this opportunity because there's an open door to something else? Should you do that or should you stay in the security of what you do know? And it's in that place where facts don't help us as much and we're looking for something more. So we're going to explore in Acts chapter 16 an occasion where the uh, eporania invades and collides with the cosmos in the will of God and understanding how it works in our life. So let me give you the context. Paul and Silas are going to the churches that Paul and Barnabas planted uh, before, and they're going back to them because in Acts chapter 15, we explored this a couple of weeks ago, the Jerusalem council the Apostle James, they made a determination on not making it too hard for the Gentiles to become Christians. And in doing so, they set aside 613 Mosaic laws uh, in order for them to be able to go in the way of, of following Jesus and not being weighed down with all these rules that would keep them from experiencing God. So they're going to head back to all those churches, Paul and Silas, and tell them the good news. So I want you to understand they're doing something really good here. But let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Here's what it says. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Pyrigia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented. Prevented. This is the Eperania invading the cosmos. The Holy Spirit, the Eperania, prevented them in the cosmos from preaching the word of uh, from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. So you got to understand that here we have a moment in the physical world where the eperonia, the spiritual, prevents them from preaching the word here. It goes on to say this. Then, coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north to the province of Bithynia, but again, again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow, did not allow them to go there. Two times, Paul and Silas face a wall. Do they walk through those walls? Well, actually, it leads to a detour for them. But you and I have moments just like that in life, don't we? Where we face a closed door relationally or professionally or educationally or even socially, a closed door, and we're left wondering, is this, is this a test? Do I just need to endure? Do I need more patience or resilience to get through this wall? Or is this God speaking somehow? Is this maybe meant to be a detour? Well, these two actually do detour, and here's what happens. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there, pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded. That's a really important word, actually. They're not certain. They've just going through the math of all the closed doors and the vision at night, they feel like, okay, maybe, maybe this is where we're supposed to go. See, we love certainty, don't we? Wouldn't, I think if this was us, wouldn't we want being certain that God was calling us to preach the good news there? But they have concluded it leaves some room for, you know, some wiggle room there. Don't, don't you love certainty? Well, actually, we don't love certainty when, it, when it's not what we want 
to be done. When God kind of speaks certainly that we should be living our life this way, we don't want that type of certainty. We prefer, we prefer uh, things to be abstract in that moment. But when it comes to a big decision in our life, we want certainty. But for even Paul, the Apostle Paul and Silas, they concluded that God was calling them to preach there. Now, no, Macedonia was not on their radar when they were headed out to uh, speak and preach and go to all these churches. It was not on their itinerary at all. But Paul and Silas faced what we do, closed doors, walled moments, where, where we hit a threshold where maybe we're at that place of decision. Do we go through it? Do we not go through it? Uh, is this what God wants for me? Is this God's will for my life? Or is it not? We don't want to make a wrong decision in this life because I think we understand sometimes there's consequences to those things. Now, here's the truth, maybe for you and for me. It's not just closed doors. Aren't open doors annoying at times? I mean, you're in a great job, you're in a great moment in your life, and all of a sudden you have another opportunity, and what seems like a great blessing is actually, man, it, it's difficult. A number of years ago, Shelly and I were, were given an opportunity to, we are pastoring in Montreal, a great church there, Evangel, and, and uh, a church from British Columbia contacted, contacted us, been watching online for a number of months, and thought we were to be their next lead pastor. We had never thought about moving our family to the West Coast. It never even crossed our minds. And, and here we were, a great situation, a great church, people who wanted us in the cosmos, in the natural, we felt like, well, we better explore this. So we prayed about it. We prayed about that open door. We explored that open door. To, but, but to be honest, and I know Shelly's watching right now tonight, we almost wished they hadn't contacted us. Because it, it moved us into a space of having to make a decision that could potentially impact our entire family. We didn't want to step out of what God's will might be. We wrestled with this. We prayed about this. We, we, we tried to explore it and work it through. What we did know, though, is because we have watched so many people, being a pastor, I've seen thousands of people make good decisions, and I've seen thousands of people make bad decisions. What we did know was, is no decision... No decision is, not, is always the wrong decision because no decision, well, no decision is a decision. So we knew this. We weren't going to get trapped like we had seen other people in a place of indecision. We knew no decision was always the wrong decision. Are you facing a moment in your life where you're faced with a decision right now and you, you, know, you want to press the delay button, delay, delay, delay? Always remember, no decision is a decision. It's always a decision in life. But we also knew, because we had watched a lot of people make some painful decisions in this life, we also knew that not every open door, not every open door is a good opportunity. Not every open door, an available moment, is good for you. But in life, there are closed doors, and there's some closed doors that should remain closed. You know, you think of those movies. You ever watch a scary movie or a TV show? There's usually an old house there. And in the house, there's a door. There's a door that has not been opened for they don't even know how long. And it won't open. And they can't find a key, but there's always one character. There's one character that just needs to know what's on the other side of the door. So part of the show sets up the moment where they find this old key. All of a sudden, they find it. It's to the old door. And the characters are walking towards the door to unlock it. And they put the key in the latch. And we, the viewers, are saying, don't open the door. Don't open the door because we know where this is going to go. But they unlock it. And they creak it open. And it unleashes all kinds of nastiness and terribleness in, the, in life. Some closed doors are not meant to be open. Not, some of them shouldn't be open. Some walled moments are not meant to be broken down. Some closed doors are meant to be circumnavigated, and they are a detour. They're a warning. But in life, too, some closed doors should be opened. Some walls need to be broken down. 1955, a cool evening in Alabama, about 5 p.m., December 1st, 1955, a 42-year-old, 5'3 woman, African-American woman, boarded a bus, bus number 2857. And she was 
blissfully unaware of the fact that that day she was going to break down a wall. She was going to bust open a door that needed to be bust open. She sat in the bus, and the bus driver asked her to get up, to give up her seat for a white passenger. And she refused. And she was arrested because of that. I I love her quote. She said this, People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was... I was, too t- I was too tired. A lot of people thought she might have been too tired from all of her work that she had done that day, and that's why she didn't give up her seat. But she said, I was not tired physically. No, the only tired I was, I was tired of giving in. That was a door worth breaking down. That was a moment that had to break down. But how do you know if it's a scary haunted house type door or if it's this opportunity door? Professionally, relationally, when you, when you come to a, a walled moment, how do you know when to break through that wall? All it's going to require is perseverance, a little bit of extra effort, or that's a wall that's a warning. No, take a detour. How do you know in your, in your professional work whether or not you should stay where you are or move on? How do you circumnavigate these moments of decision in your life? Well, I want to give you a few strategies. A few strategies of determining when to open a door, when to break through a wall, and when to leave it closed, and when to take a detour moment. I'm going to give you three walk-through wall principles. The first walk-through wall principle is this. God's will is usually found on the road to obedience. Now, I use the word usually for a reason, because in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are doing really good thing here. They're doing what God called them to do, to go and share with those churches the good news from Acts 15 that, you know, that the Gentiles have been liberated. This was a good news message. They're going to do God's work, okay? So, but usually, God's will is found on the road to obedience. Generally speaking, if you want to know God's will, If I want to know whether I should walk through a wall or walk through a closed door or leave it closed, when I obey what I know, God reveals more. When I disobey what I know, God is silent. See, some of us think that when we are in a place of disobedience, we think that God gets louder. He gets like an angry preacher and he comes at us and he's pointing a finger at us. But that's not how God responds in Scripture. In fact, if you want to be ghosted by God, all you need to do is ignore what you already know you should be doing. Ignore what you already know you should be doing. In Proverbs 4, verse 18, it says this, The way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of the day. In other words, obedience illuminates our path. Disobedience darkens our path. I've been at points in my life where where the path seemed so dark. And it, I had to pause to examine my own life. I wondered if I was in places of disobedience because sometimes that's a precisely where we are. Friends, it's a principle. If you don't know what to do tomorrow, then do what you know is right today. Stay on God's path because God will illuminate the path as you go. So with God's will, remember this, it's usually found on the pathway of obedience. The second uh, path principle is this, simply this, think plan, not blueprint when it comes to God's will. Think plan, not blueprint. Some people live like they think God's will is a, is a set of detailed blueprints for your life. He has a set of detailed plans for your life and that's, but that's not how Scripture reveals God's will to the people in Scripture. It's more like a plan. There's a difference. With blueprints, they're, they're filled with tons of details. Tons of details. Incredibly detailed. Uh, and, and it's about, uh, and you better follow every little detail on the blueprint. Because if you don't, you know, your, your building plan is not going to pass inspection. You're not going to get occupancy on it. It's filled with every little minor detail as in a blueprint. A plan, a plan is a general plan. It's a directional piece. A plan is more adaptable. You have a plan going into a game, and then the opposition responds, and you adapt the plan as you go. Well, God's will is more like a plan than a blueprint. That's how Scripture reveals it for us as individuals. I know this, though. If you're living your life like God has a blueprint for your life, you're going to live a fearful and disappointed life. 
fearful because you're not going to want to make a wrong decision. You're not going to want to mess up whatever God has for you in this life. I've met many people so concerned about making a decision because they don't want, they simply explore that space. What if? What if I choose the wrong major at school? What if I choose the wrong job? No, life is not a straight line. It's more like a plan, less like a blueprint. Uh, because a plan can adapt to the unfortunate things that do happen in life, the unexpected things that come at us in this life. Now, I'm going to say something that maybe you don't hear a lot of pastors say, and maybe you've heard pastors say the exact reverse of this, but I'm hoping this is a little bit more freeing for you. I mean, God is not so concerned about who you're going to marry as much as he is concerned with how you do marriage. You see, now, God gives house rules to marriage. He says to followers of Jesus, don't marry someone who's not a follower of Jesus because it's going to lead to a, a lot of pain in your life later. If Jesus is truly the center of your life and that important, then make sure you, you, you follow his house rules there. But it's not so much who you marry, it's how you do marriage. It's not so much what job you take, it's how you work as unto the Lord and honor your boss and, and do, it's how you work. It's not so much where you live, and people spend a lot of time like, where am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to live? It's not so much where you live as much as it is how you live. That's what God is most concerned about. And God has a plan for your life, a directional plan for your life. And inside of that plan, he has house rules. And that leads to point number one, uh, where, where that obedience continues to illuminate his plan to you. So number one, remember, God's will is usually found on the road of obedience. Number two, think of a plan, less of a blueprint when it comes to God's will. And here's the third and last one. The third one is simply this. Miraculous directions are the exception, not the norm. They're the exception, not the norm. So Paul and Silas, they're blocked twice. They're blocked twice in scripture here. And God gives them a plan to go to Macedonia. But isn't it interesting? It's not a blueprint detailed plan. He doesn't tell them what cities to go to. He doesn't tell them how long to go there. He gives them a direction to go in. He gives them a guideline to go towards. And so they pursue this plan for their lives. But many of us, we want an Acts 16 moment, don't we? I wonder how many of you are facing some big decisions right now. And you just want, you just want neon lights. You want to hear the voice of God. You want to have a dream like Paul did in a math. So you go take the job here. <laughs> go marry that person. Go find. We, we want that kind, type of revelation. And we want what we see in the older part of the Bible where Moses, Moses uh, encounters a burning bush in the middle of the desert and the bush begins to speak <laughs> and it's the voice of God coming from this bush saying go to Egypt and free my people I mean we want burning bush moments to illuminate whatever God's will is for our life but there's a couple of dangers in that a couple of dangers the first is this when we wait for the burning bush moments we'll miss God's plan for our life uh, because burning bushes as far as I can tell in scripture there's only one I've ever heard of. There's only one Acts 16 moment. Uh, these are very, they're, they're, they're exceptional in nature. They're not normative in nature. So if you're constantly waiting for a burning, and I'm not saying you can't have a, a, a moment where the epirania intersects with the cosmos and you have a, like a moment where God speaks to you, for sure, that can happen. But we don't live our life expecting it always to happen. Instead, we, if we're waiting for that, we're gonna miss God's plan for our life. Here's the second danger. When we look for the burning bush moments, we will start manufacturing them. I have seen this hundreds of times in people of faith. They so want the burning bush moment. They want the blinding light. They want the road to Damascus moment. They want to hear the voice of God so badly that last night's pizza becomes God's vision for their life. <laughs> that somehow, I've seen it when people are trying to, get, they're trying to, capture the, the, and discern who a, another person is. And sometimes they think it's God prompting them. Oh, there's something wrong with that person. But really, it's their insecurities. It's their anger. It's their brokenness. See, whenever we think God is prompting us and he's speaking to us about something, we always measure it through the lens of Scripture and wise counsel. Only then do we know it's really God prompting us. It's through Scripture. God will never say something to you 
that will contradict what he's already revealed to you. And it's through wise counsel. Wise counsel. That's a big part of where we go. See, God's will's a lot like, I heard a preacher say this years ago, God's will's a lot like a Polaroid camera. Now, I'm a child of the 70s. Do you remember Polaroid cameras? If you're that age, you know, just go ahead and post and say, I, I remember Polaroids. You know, you would take the picture, this would come out, but it wouldn't be a defined picture at first. You'd have to wait for it to come in focus. And sometimes in the 70s, we would shake it to try to speed it up. Just like we all try to speed up God revealing what, what his will is for our life. We, we kind of try to make things happen. We try to storm heaven to get that answer. But you know with the Polaroid picture, you just had to wait. And slowly it came into focus. What, what, what is that? Oh, that looks like, oh, it's an outline of a human. Okay. And you would watch it develop. See, we, we want to, and sometimes we think God's will is more like our digital camera on our phone. You take a picture, it's instantly all there. You can tell, I don't like that picture. I'm going to take another picture. But that's not how God's will and, and the plan for our life is revealed in Scripture. In fact, it's day by day, step by step. All of the heroes of our faith are never given the entire itinerary. They're given the next day. See, God's delivery system is a just-in-time delivery system. Just in time. That's what makes us people of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's just in time, but God always delivers on time. Friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, in, Acts, in John chapter 16, Jesus says that God has given us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is our guide, he says in John chapter 16. He's our guide in this life. And this is how it works, near as I can tell. I'm going to give you a little life hack. If you're facing any moment, if you're not, you will someday. You'll face a moment where you face an open door. Should you walk through it or should you not? You'll face a closed door. Should you break it down or should you, should you open it up or should you leave it closed? You'll face a moment where you've, you sense a big wall in front of you. Should you detour to another place or should you go through that wall? Well, here, here's a little cheat here. First, use your brain. Use your brain. And this is cosmos language. Use your brain. Common sense is a gift from God. The French philosopher Voltaire said this, that common sense is not so common. And unfortunately, that's true, isn't it, in life? If it was really easy, if common sense was really common, well, this world would operate a lot, be a lot better than it does. But, but employ your brains. Use your brains. The facilities and the faculties that God has already given to you at your disposal. And then here's where the epirania begins to intersect. Play by the rules. Play by the rules. What rules? Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 has always been some of my favorite verses when I've been trying to explore what God's will is for my life. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But it says this, lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. Leaning not on your own understanding. Meaning, okay, employ the common sense, but also don't lean just on what you do know in this life. Acknowledge him in all the areas of your life, and he'll direct your path. The idea is this. Let scripture shape your thinking. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 would be a great passage of scripture for you to look up this week and just meditate on, where we allow our minds to be renewed into the thinking that God has so that we can operate in this world, in the cosmos, in a way that is congruent with God's mind and heart. And the third one is simply this. Listen to the Spirit when He speaks. How does the Spirit speak to us? Well, in the Bible, and I, I think if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you've experienced this. I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to me when I feel conviction. When I feel convicted. I know the Holy Spirit speaks words of encouragement to me. The Holy Spirit emboldens us, and the Holy Spirit guides us. You see, friends, in life, you and I are going to make some bad decisions in life. You're going to walk through doors you shouldn't have walked through. You're going to walk through open doors that, that just because it was open, it's, it wasn't a good door to be opened to. You're going to, you're going to break open doors that should have been remained shut. You're going to walk through walls that you should have walked around. And some of us are sitting in the seat of consequences of some bad decisions already. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate? 
Because we're all going to make decisions that move us further from God's plan for our life. Well, I've shared a, a, a while ago in this church, when I was a teenager, I, I'd made a lot of decisions that moved me further from God's plan for my life. It started out with I had some intellectual incongruencies. I was just struggling with the whole idea of God and faith. I had some intellectual problems, and those things became real hiccups in my life, and they led to really rebellion. Like, I, I, was, I want it my way. I didn't want God's way. And, you know, I've shared in the past, if you're new to One Church Deal, maybe you may have missed this, but I shared in the past, my dad was key to me finding faith and restoring my faith in God. I, because I think he challenged me intellectually, that was really good. But one of the things, and if you know someone who's maybe wandering from God, um, I love the posture of my dad. My, my dad was, if he, he really believed that if I truly desired truth, eventually all of my exploring would end in the person of Jesus. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. So he had a quiet confidence that I would find my way back to God. So he wasn't always trying to fight me on every moment. He was present he, he engaged. He was present with me. But what I haven't shared is really a stranger moment, a stranger things moment. In my bedroom at 1461 Manawaganish Road in St. John, New Brunswick, where, where God spoke to me. It was an inaudible voice, but it was a voice. And I, all of a sudden in the memory, because I thought I had blown it. I thought I had missed God's plan for my life. I had walked through so many doors I shouldn't have walked through. I had broken down walls. I should have went around. And in that moment, I, I remembered a verse from Romans where it says, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I've shared that before, but this is the part I haven't shared. That wasn't enough for me. I'd heard my whole life, God loves you and God has a plan for your life. And often, sometimes the people who told me God loves me were some, sometimes not very kind. They weren't very loving themselves. I, I, it was so general that I couldn't squeeze it around. But it was in that moment that the lyrics of a song I sang in the church when I was growing up came back to me. And the lyric was simply this, Thy loving kindness is better than life. In my bedroom at 1461 Madden Road, I got stuck on that word kindness. Now I could sink my teeth into kindness. Kindness made some sort of sense to me. Friends, no matter where you're at in life right now, no matter where you think God is at, if you think he's an angry preacher pointing a finger at you, you couldn't be more wrong. The predisposition of God towards you is tenderness. It's loving and it's kind. Now, none of us want to think of ourselves as being unkind. But kind is not just a disposition. It's not just a good intention. Kindness is an action. So let me speak truth just before we end in prayer here. The truth is, friends, God loves you. God loves you. And that might sound abstract. That might sound a little ushy-gushy. It might feel like I've heard that a thousand times. I love what the great theologian of the Christian church, St. Augustine, said. He said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. See, friends, you're not just one in seven billion people. You're the only one of you God has made. As far as God's concerned, you're irreplaceable. God loves you. Not only does God love you, God is kind to you. This means that God is looking for moments and situations and ways to actively, because kindness is an action, to show his kindness to you. It means that he's storing up in his heart good things and good thoughts and good intentions towards you. That's God's predisposition disposition towards you. The Apostle Paul says in Romans that it is the kindness of God that leads us to change, to change our ways so that we can be on his path and follow his plan. Friends, none of us will journey perfectly in this life. We'll all miss the mark. I want you to remember this. If you're sitting in the consequences of, of some bad choices in this life, or you're facing the threshold of a decision, and you're, you're struggling right in the middle of this, I want you to understand God's heart is always towards redemption, restoration, kindness, tenderness, and love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence and your spirit. 
And no matter where people are viewing from in this moment, I know that you're present with them. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would remind them of your great love towards them and your kindness, your tender, loving kindness towards them. And God, for those who are facing big decisions in life right now, I pray, God, that you would help them to to use their brains, (laughs) to to play by the rules, God. And God, I, I pray that you would help them, God, to navigate that space and make a decision that will honor you. God, that they will hear your spirit speaking to them in this moment. And God, in the moments where we can't hear you, in the moments where we're not sure, help us to walk in what we already know. God, we give you our lives and we ask you to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope this talk has helped you clarify an approach that you can take when you're faced with the potential of an open door or the interruption of a closed one. Videos like this are just one part of an ongoing conversation. So we invite you to keep journeying with us. It's actually why we exist as a church, to help people to know God, love people, and impact our city. If you want to know more about One Church TO, our team has put together some links to help you connect. You'll find them just below this video window or at the top of this page. You can feel free to share this video if you found it helpful. And for more teaching videos and other content from One Church TO, hit subscribe. Thanks for watching.